Hello everyone and welcome back to the Red YouTube channel and to a returning episode of the Solitary series of me, Jonathan Petz. I'm once again joined by James Zuccarelli and Clay Reed. Hey guys, how you doing? Hey Johnny. <laughs> thank you for joining us for another episode and thank you to everyone watching live and also watching After the Fact on YouTube as well. Uh, we've got a really exciting session today, something that's been quite hotly requested over the past couple of months, in fact over the past year or so. We're actually going to be diving in and looking at remote production and how you can use a DSMC2, a Ranger or a Komodo to aid in that and elevate your production value and hopefully make it a little bit easier as well. Um, we're going to be looking at how you can ingest video calls into things like Zoom. You want to get your camera feed into an OBS stream. Um, things that we've been asked, hey, how, how are you, Johnny, getting your Ranger into this Zoom call? How are you using your Komodo to do this web chat? All those kind of things to, to basically expand your arsenal. Um, in the second half of the session, we're going to be looking at Komodo's new party trick with the FTPS update, looking at how you can upload and download files from the camera over a network, which is really, really cool. That's going to be lookup tables, CDLs, presets, firmware upgrades, and also upload, or, sorry, download the raw files from the camera as well over the network. So that's really, really cool. So I reckon we kind of get started. Obviously, as always, feel free to chuck some questions into the chat as we go. We want to make this as interactive as possible. Um, so let's dive into it. So I think initially we're going to start off with why remote production? Why are we going to want to be getting access to the image files remotely over the network as over the past year or so, uh, we've had to socially distance and we can't have as many people on set. So there's going to be kind of two avenues from a, a safety standpoint and also a creative standpoint where hopefully after uh, the global pandemic subsides, we can still utilize some of these kind of things we'll learn today to en enhance our production. And I kind of think Clay is probably most aptly uh, here to discuss from a safety standpoint, how much his production changed when he was shooting the Komodo release stuff. So Clay, how much of a shock was it to the system having such a change to the way you work? Yeah, you know, a lot of the time I work with the Slimmer crew anyway, but this was slim. I mean, we went down to just myself and two other guys. We have Nar and Jay, and they were helping me out. And basically for us, a lot of it was about the connectivity and about safety and about keeping talent safe. And so we're accessing cameras through the Wi-Fi. We're doing all these different things. And what it really made me think is I'm in this place where we get to do awesome creative things, but sometimes for product shots, I'm wanting to send something back to the brass here at Red and say, hey, what do you think of this angle? Are we highlighting this the way you wanted or the way that you were thinking? And I've been in other shoots where we take time out of that whole schedule and, and stop the shoot and review things, sending over really crappy iPhone captures of people's monitors and things like that, where it's really tough to get a true sense of exactly what you're seeing. And some of the stuff that we're going to talk about today really has enabled me to streamline that workflow, to be able to show people actual footage from the camera, from the shot that we're going to use for approval purposes, as well as just keeping people up to date on how the shoot's going in general. <laughs> I mean, that's one of the things. It's keeping the production as fast and as smooth as possible. Uh, like you, Kai, I worked on a production during the lockdown, and it was literally a WhatsApp group filled with the entire production, just and me and the DP sending photos. The director was calling the actors, giving them feedback, and it just made it so slow. So hopefully some of the things we'll learn today can hopefully speed that up. Well, but also and, and, just from, and, go ahead, James. I was just going to say, and from a creative standpoint, right, everyone's idea of what the medium close-up looks like is a little bit different, right? So rather than have either an iPad or a phone on top or the ghost in the, the mirrored image, it really allows you to really dial it in and not have to guess whether or not that window is going to work, right? A lot of times we're doing this off of a, uh, maybe a, you know, an Airbnb photo of what the room might look like. No, I can actually be in the room and invite you guys in to actually control my camera. Well, no, exactly. You know, there's, there's so many use cases for, you know, remote production, you know, even outside of, of the COVID world uh, in an unmanned camera position. If you're using pyrotechnics or if you're in a hospitable environment, if you've got an animal trap camera where you can't get to the camera, but you still want to be able to control the camera, interact with it and view it these kind of tools that we're going to show today can really help with that. Now, we have done some previous sessions on the apps for uh, Ranger and DSMC2 and Komodo. Uh, we've got some, so go check out the playlist, I think on the left or right here, uh, to go check out the full control and red control apps. But we're going to focus on the tools to kind of get that video kind of up and running. 
Um, mm -hmm. But just from a creative standpoint, as James was saying, maybe there's some situations where maybe you're doing a sensitive interview. Maybe it's just the interviewee and the interviewer in an environment where they don't want any crew around them to, to put them off and you want to be able to still interact and make changes to the camera. Um, also, loads of situations where the camera is tricky to get to. Gimbals, drones, techno cranes, steady cams. The amount of times that I've gone over to a steady cam and wanted to make some changes while they're balancing it and just seeing them glare at me and kind of go, okay, I'll come back in a few minutes. But being able to access the camera and make changes wirelessly is really, really awesome. Um, so I reckon we'll kind of dive into the tools we use because it may just be as simple as you want to have the best webcam on that town hall, on that production meeting and kind of look the best with the camera that you've got. So I think James is going to start us off with what do you use to get your stream up and running then James? Yep. Thanks, Johnny. And I remember back when we were originally starting this a year plus back, we were doing this with our integrated cameras and here we were coming from red and, and we wanted to have that higher look. We wanted to have that depth of field and really we had such great cameras, but how do you get that into your laptop or computer? Now, most of us have a HDMI or something on our port on our laptop or our PC, but most of those are an output. So what we're going to go ahead and show you here is a quick little uh, video of how you can take your Komodo and with something like a capture card, Magewell, uh, Elgato makes some great ones. You're looking at a Magewell SDI here. And what I'm going to go ahead and do is use the USB-C connection on this Magewell capture card, go into my USB-C on my uh, Razer laptop here. And then it's just the standard SDI out of my Komodo. Now with this one I'm using here, it does have the loop through option. So you do want to make sure that that SDI is going into the input and not the pass through. That would, would, would be allowed to let you record to, record to an other external recorder. But now with uh, once that's plugged in, this will now show up as another virtual camera option. And here we are now using that full quality with that lens that we want coming from that Komodo. And I think it, this is really nice because essentially, like you said earlier, if we took the step to do port forwarding, now I could essentially have Johnny or Clay open up their app and they're now using their app with all of their you know, custom preferences and presets already in there. And Johnny, you could be in London and, and you could be taking control of that. So I think really that's the benefit there and uh, not having to uh, not having to guess on what that window or what that shot will look like with the, with the actual camera that we're going to use for the production. No, yeah. exactly. Okay. Oh. I was just going to say, and it's, it's really cool because as someone who makes images for a living, a lot of the time, like when you show up on a zoom call, you want your camera feed to die randomly. Um, <laughs> and so <laughs> when you show up on a zoom call, you really want it to look the best that it possibly can. And every time it could be getting a better job. It could be getting a better rate on a job just because when you show up, the actual quality of the image that you're representing is of the quality of an image you would like to make for these people, these clients. And so I really think that that's like a huge step for keeping that quality up. And the other thing that to me occurs is that I film a lot of videos of myself, right? So a lot of these YouTube style videos where we're doing tech demonstrations and I'm the camera operator and the talent. And the, these type of features allow me to monitor my camera, to use different things like focus assist over a monitor so I can tell that I'm not blowing a take. There's just a ton of things that are really, really valuable about this style of webcam. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No, definitely. I mean, one of the things you've got to consider initially is how am I outputting from my device? Am I hardwiring coming out of my device? Is that SDI or is it HDMI? Because that's going to impact the capture cards that you're going to be using because that capture card is essentially acting as a webcam input device. So James showed one there that was SDI and there are also plenty of options for HDMI, which in many cases are a little bit more affordable than their SDI counterparts. Now, one of the things I'm going to kind of show here that I use is called the Atem Mini. And this is a fantastic device that allows you to have multiple inputs coming into one single output source. So as you can see there, there's one, two, three, four, and that gives me the ability to have four camera input, input feeds coming in and then through the webcam output, mix that in real time, which is really, really flexible. If you've got a multi-cam shoot going on, you can be interacting and tapping between them kind of in real time. 
But then the other kind of thought process that might be there is, hey, my production wants to see all of those cameras at the same time. Well, as James was showing, what you can do is you can literally have multiple capture devices. So this is a HDMI counterpart of what James showed there. Very, very affordable. I think it's about $70. You've got an HDMI input coming in. If you've got a certain module on your camera, you can obviously convert out of HDMI with a small little uh, SDI converter device. So this is what I've got on my Ranger because I come in through the Atem. So a simple SDI in converts to HDMI. There is a USB port on the Ranger so I can power that device as well, which makes it really, really nice. And then essentially, what you need is an application to bring all of those sources together and allow you to mix them. Now, I use OBS, Clay uses XSplit, there's loads of other options out there. But then what that essentially means is, if I switch over to this view here, I can have multiple cameras going into a Zoom feed. There's a little bit of a delay on camera C there because that's actually over the Ethernet, so it's a bit of a delay compared to SDI. But a production can now be viewing all of the feeds that are on a set instantly, all through a Zoom call, all through a Hangouts call, or through a Teams, or if your uh, studio's got a specific application, it's all coming through there very easily because OBS and XSplit can act as a virtual webcam, which is really, really awesome. And I mean, Clay, you know, uh, you've forgotten uh, on, a, on, a, on a couple of our Zoom calls uh, <laughs> to, to, to have a capture device, and Komodo's got a quite a cool little trick that you can do to, to, to still get that input feed. Yep, I sure have. And there's this great thing called the Komodo link, and I'm going to show you guys right now. So this is my setup. This is what I'm running right now. That's an Ethernet plugged in to a USB-C adapter into the Komodo link, and that's giving the feed that you're seeing from camera A. And over my shoulder, I'm using DSMC2, and that's going to be right over here. It's a Monstro. That one's running actually through an SDI capture card, a Magewell, the same as James's, right? So you can run all of these succinctly together. And then finally, I've got my Ranger over here, which is running an SDI converter the same as Johnny's. And so like, OK, so you forgot. You have five different options, right? You have a million different ways that you can work around this problem because it happens. I'm forgetful. I leave things in the truck sometimes or sitting on my desk. And it's like features like these that make it so that I always have a fallback method. No, exactly. I mean, the, the, the final one just to discuss there is we've got cabled solutions for our DSMC2 and Ranger. We've got a wireless Komodo, but you can also go wireless on a DSMC2 camera or really any camera as long as you've got a video transmitter. So I've got a Bolt, a DSMC2 Bolt and a receiver, and that has HDMI and SDI out. So I simply take that HDMI out of the Teradek into my capture card and you can be anywhere in the world with a 4G hotspot and then anyone could be chiming into your production and kind of seeing what's going on. So what I'm going to do is uh, I am going to jump over to my, uh, to my DSMC2 here, take a little spin just outside the Red London store here while these guys kind of talk through that. So I'm just going to switch over and then let you guys take over. Yep. And, yeah. and, and while Johnny is setting that up, I don't know if you guys were able to see that. I just did a quick toggle where I was able to go from my DSMC2 Gemini, which I understand does look you know, quite well, to the integrated camera. And if we are doing streams, and this is what I am doing for a living, right? I definitely am seeing the difference. So I saw some comments about coming from 8K and going down to this, but it is something where we are seeing a visual difference. And let's go ahead and see Johnny's camera here. Yeah, Johnny's getting right in position. So Johnny, I believe, is also on a Gemini, and he's actually using the Teradek module for the DSMC2 to send this wireless feed. Ah, oh, London. We've been to London, Clay. Right? Yeah. This is great. I didn't it's have to get so a plane foggy. ticket. <laughs> oh, there, that looks like London. Yeah. Ah, oh, it's beautiful. And, there we go. First we stop go. if I make it out there. <laughs> Pretty cool stuff here. Yeah. I mean, like things like this, it always reminds me just how much faster you can move on set when you're using technology like this. I mean, imagine running the cable and the camera assistant that's got to chase Johnny around and make sure he's not tripping over himself or sending mm -hmm. things flying, all of that. Like, this is the type of technology that makes sets run more succinctly, but it also gives people the opportunity to social distance, right? So one of the things I know Johnny and I have been talking about a bunch is a change to Video Village. Like the idea that you used to have two monitors that are sitting there and all the different departments need to come up 
Oh, Johnny, great job. Just had to say, <laughs> had to break there for a moment. Excellent mm -hmm. camera work. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but yeah, I was saying that, you know, Video Village can change. It used to be two monitors that every department was crowding around. And now using the app, using wireless technology like this, having the cameras interconnected on networks means that you're going to be able to do a lot of this stuff more easily. Hair and makeup can be in their tent looking at the feed, making sure last looks are great and they don't need to come with a blow dryer and get that messy hair out of the way. I mean, even when you've got like a splinter unit or a second unit where they typically go off into this unknown void and it's like, I don't know what they're doing. If you're a DP, you send them off. Hopefully they're getting what I wanted. But if you have production set up with a laptop, a 4G connection and an input, you could be monitoring and making sure they're getting the shots the editors wanted and all these kind of things. Because sometimes things do get lost in translation sometimes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I reckon, oh, go ahead, James. I was just going to say that was a nice segue into one of the new updates with Komodo. And Johnny, I think you were going to talk a little bit about this. And we're going to talk about this. And this is all via the new firmware update in 1.5. And Johnny, go ahead. And uh, we're going to start talking a little bit about FTPS, which is file transfer protocol, but it's also secure. No, yeah. Well, yeah. So, yeah, it's one of probably my favorite updates for the Komodo that has come out recently. Uh, and that's the ability to, over a network, view various directories and move items between them. So you can upload files like LUTs, CDLs, um, presets, firmware upgrades, if you want to do that. So if you're a rental house, you can kind of move your firmware upgrade files and upgrade all of your cameras kind of simultaneously but then you can also download files at the same time as well. So if you've got R3D raw files, ProRes MOV files, you can also download those from the camera. Now, you have two options. You can do this wirelessly, or you can do it um, hardwired through the Komodo link adapter. I'll show you that in a moment. But the speed differences will vary there. If you're over Wi-Fi, we would suggest only really doing uh, you know, small files, LUTs, CDLs, those kind of things. But if you want to be moving media off from the camera without having to take the card out, we'd highly suggest having a cabled connection through the USB-C and using a USB-C to Ethernet adapter. Just in terms of some numbers, the download speed is essentially the maximum speed of gigabit Ethernet with a little bit of leeway for some uh, encryption. So around 125 meg, it may go a little bit below that 70 meg, depending on your network. But in some instances, that could be exactly what you need. And one use case that I'm going to kind of bring up kind of off the bat is one of our rental partners, ProMotion. So ProMotion have actually built this kind of interview setup. Basically, this rocks up on, on, on someone's doorstep, a interviewee's doorstep. Uh, they open the box, open the laptop. There's a Komodo in there. You've got a nice light in there. You've got a Komodo link on there. And then somebody can be accessing the camera, checking the settings um, very, very easily. And you've still got a fantastic image to work with because there's been so many productions that I've seen where the call is done through the integrated webcam or the interview is done through the webcam. And it just really brings down that production quality down. But by having a system like this from ProMotion, being able to open it up and instantly kind of being set up and having somebody control it remotely is really, really cool. Um, so I reckon we kind of dive in and set it up. I mean, Clay, I know you've been playing around with it quite a lot. Um, yeah. I think FTPS feature is so sick. I mean, just little things like you were saying, sending a firmware upgrade or, hey, you know, that was weird. I need to save a log, right? Little things like that are, are huge. And like, it's just another place where, hey, if you're forgetful like me, here's a safety net. Oh, no mag, no mag reader with you? Well, now you got an option, right? So there's these little things that it's like, it sounds like the smallest thing. But I've been on so many sets where the whole thing comes to a screeching halt because one little bit of kit isn't there. And that's why these safety nets are so valuable. These little things that help you diversify the way that you're using your equipment. And I'm really, really excited about FTPS. And I mean, look at where the industry is going with camera to cloud. All these different features are really starting to become super integral to the way that we process and the way that we have our workflows now. And I think that these are the type of steps that, that we're taking because it's that important, but it's also that valuable and saves so much time. Mm -hmm. And Clay, Clay, you and I were talking about it where Clay actually has a Komodo that he keeps in the top of his bag. And when you do find that extra creative sh shot here, we don't necessarily have to have any of the other cameras stop. 
we can discreetly access Clay's camera, either upload the same preset, or maybe Clay got the banger shot that we need for the highlight reel, and we're still doing the actual event. I don't have to stop Clay. I can go in there, discreetly start downloading that file, and if it is a fixed camera position, let's run an Ethernet cable out to there, because essentially we can go ahead and, and start offloading that even quicker. I do want to clarify that, yes, we can maybe forget this, but you do need to have a card in the camera. So this is not something that's going to allow you to bypass media. You do want to record to the card in the camera. That's going to give you the best quality. What we're talking about here is another way to make this even more creative, more flexible, and safer on set. So I think what we'll do now is we'll jump over to the camera, run you through how to set that up yourself, and then we'll look at a use case for this as well. So I'm just going to chop over to my second camera. Can you guys see that? Yes. Yep. Awesome. So here we are on my Komodo. Now, as you can see, I have the link adapter with a USB-C to Ethernet adapter. Um, very, very cheap online, uh, as long as you're getting one that's gigabit Ethernet. Now, obviously, you can do this through Wi-Fi, but the speeds will be a little bit slower. But essentially, what you're doing is you're going into communication, and you're checking your connection method first. So if I go into my Komodo link adapter, I can see that an IP address has already been generated for me. That means I'm on the network and my host machine should then be able to connect to that. So I'm going to back out and then simply go into FTPS and this is where I'm seeing my settings. So you're, you can only access this through the camera itself. You can't get this in the app and that's mainly for security. So someone can't come in here and start making changes to what's got read and write access. So you've got a username, FTP1. You can then set your own password here as well. And you've then got the ability to choose what has read and write access. So I know some people may initially be going, oh, I'm a bit worried about having the media accessible. You can turn that off if you want to, so no one can access that. What I'm going to do now is we're going to go back over to my machine and see how we can connect up to the camera. So I'm going to come back here and just go to my desktop. And here we are on the desktop. You can see the camera on the left. I've already connected with that IP address that we had. And now here we are in FileZilla. So there's plenty of free applications and paid applications to access cameras over a network. I use FileZilla just because it's something that I've been familiar with. So what you're doing is you are putting in your, your IP address here at the top. You're taking your username, the password, and in terms of a port, if that's ever asked for, port 21. Uh, and in terms of some other applications, it may ask for some sort of encryption method. If it's TLS or SSL, make sure you're selecting that there is some degree of encryption there as well, because if not, the connection won't handshake. Then what we're going to do is we're going to do quick connect. I'm going to establish a new connection. And here we are. You can see on the right hand side, the camera has now connected. And I've got access to seeing all the folders that are on the camera. So if I come into presets, I can see the presets that I've already made on the camera. I can see if there's media on the camera as well. I can see my shots. And if I wanted to, I could start offloading those. But what's really cool is we've got the ability to upload things and have those. Oh, I think someone's mic's going a bit crazy there. Oh, I think we're good there. A little fire alarm. Sorry about oh, that. Folks. Oh, dear. <laughs> But essentially here, what we can do is we can upload things in real time. And we've all been in that situation where something's changed, the DP wants to make a change, the director wants to make a change, and you've basically got no time to do it at all. But if your DIT is connected or if you're connected, you can make those changes in real time. So I'm going to come here and we're going to do a LUT and I'm also going to copy over a firmware upgrade as well. So this is the list of lookup tables that I've already got on the camera. And if I want to upload one, I've got to go into the uploads into the LUTs folder specifically. And what I'm going to do is let's pick one here. So let's go for the, that's what was a bit of a crazy one. Let's go for the Move one here. So all I do is I copy that into this folder and instantly you can see that has now been copied over and I can now apply that. Let's do another one. Let's do the black and white one. Copy that over. That's now copied over instantly. And that LUT, I haven't got to go over there, take the card out, copy it over, bring the LUT back over and apply it. It speeds things up so quickly. Mm -hmm. Let's just change my LUT back. And I mean, even then, we can come in. I can now do a firmware upgrade. So I'm going to come in here into 1.5, the latest beta that came out. I can now upload this file to the camera. You can see really, really quickly. That's now started, almost completing there. And if I wanted to, I could then go and initiate this upgrade. So I can come in here, let's go into upgrade. And we're doing an upgrade here now live instantly. Imagine if you had multiple cameras doing this, you could just speed up that process so, so much. 
Johnny, you just blew my mind by doing a firmware upgrade midstream. I will say that, <laughs> that right there. I, I'm buying you a drink next time I can see you live. Uh, we're Maybe seeing a little some bit really nervous. great questions come in, so keep asking those questions. We will address them here at the end. Uh, I did want to steal your role there. But guys and gals watching this, to see what Johnny just did there was essentially drag and drop to a camera without ever having to touch it, discreetly pulling that clip. So now looking at my shot right now, if you don't want to trust that that window behind me is not clipped, the DIT can pull a clip, go ahead, run a quick LUT on it, run a quick grade and reassure everyone that we're not going to have to do reshoots because everything is here is great. So great way once again that we can keep being creative, keep the production value high and really get even more done in a given day. I mean, one of the interesting things here, it's not something that I would necessarily suggest, but because the R3D gets segmented, in theory, what you can do is actually pull one of the segments while the clip is still being done. So if there's a situation where maybe you think, oh, what was that in the background? Has that ruined the take? Because there are only two, two and a bit gig chunks, you could download one of the segments, check it very, very quickly while the take is still being done. And that's one of the benefits of R3D because it does it into those split chunks. With, with a ProRes or something, you can't do that. So not necessarily suggested, but something that if in the, you know, that specific use case where you need to check it instantly, the possibility is there for you. Mm -hmm. And, and, and we, we mentioned pyrotechnics, but it's maybe not pyrotechnics, maybe it's just safety, right? How many times has that car bounced a little far? Or maybe, let's think of Phil Grossman here, right, where maybe something's just a little too radioactive. I would like to get all of that quality and maybe not disturb wherever that camera is, and we just showed you a great way to do that. I mean, especially if you're coming in, maybe maybe you're doing a lot of interviews throughout a day. You can just be trickling those off throughout the day. And I mean, as we talked about, Clay is saying, you know, going from straight from the camera, potentially into an FTP server, that FTP server could be looking for those files and running dailies off for you instantly. There's kind of so much that could be done here, especially with how camera to cloud with frame IO is kind of really picking up over the past couple of months and years, really. Yeah, I, I think it's the coolest thing in the world. I mean, just for myself, like I said, it, it's a lot of the times doing red text, which, by the way, keep an eye out. There's one coming soon about this very same topic. When we're doing this stuff, I'm, I'm alone a lot of the time, and I do, I use those features. I'll be offloading one clip as I'm rolling the next clip to make sure that I can actually see that my focus is good, audio's intact, like all of those things are really, really beneficial. And I've started to do that more now that I'm moving over to shooting a lot of the stuff on Komodo. I've started to use this functionality more and more and more. It's just, it's pretty sick. And it's just, I mean, it's brand new. And I'm already like converting all my workflow to, to <laughs> take parts of it. <laughs> Maybe we actually had a very good question there uh, from Digify. Is this available on the Epic W? So this is not available on DSMC2 or Ranger. Although you can connect to the cameras over Ethernet if you've got the correct cables. That's just for the control over the camera, like with a full control app or a Mac OS kind of app as well. All these features are, you know, the benefits of such a new system with the uh, with the new pins on the top and the USB-C output. That's what allows us to kind of do th this kind of functionality. Mm -hmm. I also saw one about uh, whether we trust setting looks uh, remotely on any, any different person's monitor, and I would say no. <laughs> and they asked also if, if it's raw, and, and that's the part that I think is important, is the idea is that a lot of these looks are for reference, right? They're not what you want finally on the piece, and so I would suggest anybody that, yes, monitor calibration is hugely important, especially when you're doing things like setting looks and importing those into the camera, and you always want to consider that that should be a reference and the raw material is what really, really matters. But well, one of the nice things now is with the new firmware update, you can now get your tools via the stream, right? Via that overlay, so we can check the raw. Once again, you're just looking at the reference like Clay's talking about there, but if I am the DP in another location, I can check the raw because we now can get that via the, the live stream feed. So huge right there. I'm a big peaking guy, so when we say, don't trust the focus of the, of the 720p live stream. No, I'm going to actually turn on peaking or edge mode, and I can es essentially rack there with my, uh, with my talent. I just had a, a question come in there from, uh, from Addison. Um, what is the range I can access FTP? So there's two methods, obviously. So Wi-Fi is dependent on if you're in ad hoc or infrastructure mode. 
If you're an ad hoc, you kind of really want to be next to the camera within a couple of feet. If you're doing infrastructure, again, this depends on if you've got a whole network with mesh routers or if you've got one router at the top of your house. So that's very dependent there. Uh, but if you're doing a hardwired ethernet approach, as long as you can get an ethernet and a router and a switch, you, you can connect to this from anywhere. And based off our previous episodes of the Solitary series with port forwarding, anybody in the world in theory with the correct credentials could sign in and check files upload files maybe you've got your colorist sat in their nice swanky area in hollywood and you're out in the middle of nowhere they've got a new lut they could just upload it straight to the camera for you if you've got that kind of thing set up so um range is definitely a a, a specific use case kind of thing mm -hmm. yeah. But if you are in the home studio, right, I'm just going to go ahead. I've got my Komodo connected right here. It's on the same wireless network that we're using here. And if Johnny and Clay and I took the time to set up port forwarding beforehand, I could switch my view here. And essentially, Johnny can go ahead and pull focus for me, frame. And we're going to say hi to my dog, Hallie, here. And then Carlton. Hey, guys. I think he heard his name. <laughs> oh, yeah. And they're waking up now. And once again, as I switch my camera view back, there's nothing plugged into that. No capture card, no Magewell, no USB-C. This allows me to go just like Johnny did and did that walk and talk. But once again, that's just using the wireless network that's in our house. Just going through, seeing some other questions here. Had a question from Onboard Camera IT. Um, so in terms of the control port, so on the Komodo, the Komodo is using RCP2 on the control port, whereas DSMC2 Ranger, they're using RCP1. So you've got to make sure that your device is updated for RCP2. Now, if you're wanting to do run stop, what you can do is through the extension port on the camera, there's plenty of accessories that break that out into something like three pin RS which then works like any kind of normal contact closure trigger. There's the wooden camera B-Box. We make our own expander module. We've also got a flying lead cable. So if you wanted to, you could wire up your own cable. So if you're just as simple as run stop, you can get a breakout cable. But if you want to use a control port, you've got to make sure you're using RCP2. And I'm showing a couple of those options, both the red Perfect. expander Perfect. module and then the wooden camera B-Box. I, I really like this one just because I can essentially put it right here in one of my BP Canon sl uh, battery slots. And look at that. I'm now having the run stop, um, control, everything, my five volt charge all right there. And, it's, and it just goes right into that same EXT port right there on the bottom. For those that might ask, what can I use with RCP2 currently? Currently, you're kind of looking at the uh, small HD, Cine 7, ND7, the Focus Pro. Those are uh, some monitors that you can access the menus through that control port. Um, I saw a question on microphones. Remember, all of our DSMC2 Rangers and Komodos do have in-camera microphones. Primarily, those are for scratch purposes. But there are microphones in there. And with this new firmware update, big push, because right now I'm wearing an external lab, I can plug that into the Komodo, have an internal as well as an external microphone in. And big shout out to Mikhail here. I can also come over to my app and Look at that, we're actually monitoring right here via that red control app as well. So once again, just one other way to be creative. And for my gimbal, I just mount that on a nice little C clamp and then I have my audio reference or my focus pull all right there from a nice touch screen app. So it's super, super, super flexible. Feel free to fire in any other questions, guys. We'll kind of keep yeah. this going for, for a few more minutes. But I mean, hopefully with all these things, you can start to think about how you can integrate your red camera into your production. You know, if you're out in the middle of nowhere, you haven't just got to be in a studio environment like this. A simple 4G connector, if you've got 4G where you are, a laptop with a capture card, and anyone in the world can be uh, chiming in and giving you feedback, uh, whether you may want that feedback or not from your clients. <laughs> <laughs> right? I mean, I've been on shoots where everything shuts down. It's like, it's so funny to see. And, and the actual approval method is so thin. I'll put it that way, right? So like we're sending pictures of a screen displaying a picture. It's that's like the worst case scenario. <laughs> and, like, and so it, it's just, it's funny to me that like, 
that we're going to be looking back on that stuff going like, man, can you believe they did that instead of just saving a screenshot on your phone from the actual feed of the camera and sending that to people? Like, it's just, it's, it's cool to be at this point where these things are starting to really happen. Got a question there from Joe Elements about the does the mic input support audio timecode? So the camera's not expecting audio timecode, but if your tentacle or or however you're planning to input timecode outputs the signal, the the camera will record whatever signal that's coming in through the audio timecode port. I know some people who have been testing it with some of the Zoom, I think it's the F6. Um, because the camera is not sending anything back out through the mic input, you may run into some issues there, but definitely check it beforehand. But the best solution for time code is going through that EXT port and have a device constantly jamming it. I, I wouldn't probably go through the mic input. Um, I mean, yeah, in terms of from a tentacle, try and go in through the EXT port. Sorry, I just pinged up the, the wrong question there. Um, Got another one here from Jan, who's asking about getting a feed into Red Cine X. So you wouldn't use Red Cine X. So Red Cine X is looking for physical media on the drive for kind of checking files and monitoring them. If you just want to monitor a camera, having that come into an onset monitor to check, or if you're having it through what we've discussed here today, having it come in through a capture card into Zoom or OBS, something like that, that's how you'd use that. So. Red Cine X primarily just for viewing actual files of media. Mm -hmm. And, and we, we're, we're becoming less and less dependent on Red Cine X now that we can go into all of the NLEs natively raw. But for doing quick check purposes, like we were talking about just there, when I download a quick FTP file um, via that FTPS, I may bring it into Red Cine X. Why? Because that's what it's there for, a quick checksum program. I don't have to go into Resolve or Premiere or Avid just yet, but that's what I would use it. Not for live monitoring, but just for that quick check and maybe to just to see, hey, that preset, that LUT, that one that I usually go to for this colorist, I can drop that on there and just kind of see, is this typically what we like to pass over? So good checksum program, not necessarily as required. Um, I saw a question on building your own cables. One of the great things about working with RED is our ops guide gives really great detailed um, pinout diagrams, right? There are great examples. We now have uh, new cables right there on red.com. However, if you do want to create that for your own custom application, yeah, it, there's no gobbledygook there. We actually print that all out, and uh, you can go ahead and create those if you like. So just putting a link into the chat for anybody that is interested in kind of setting up their own cables. Oh, I did it in the wrong section there. There we go. So if you're interested in building your own cables or through a rental house, kind of providing those, you can wire that up for any of the breakouts that you might need, be that gen lock time code, run stop, uh, control port, all those kind of things you can do through that cable there. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, well, yeah, that was awesome. Well, feel free to ask any more questions, guys. Once again, quick lay of the land. I'm shooting into a Gemini and a Monstro here. I know Clay has some really cool angles and Clay, we were talking about how you dialed those in beforehand. Was that yeah. a consuming process or was that something that you were able to do pretty much yeah, before was, the stream? Yeah, it was really mellow. And like each camera has a, like its own little flavor and each lens on there is actually different. I don't have a single matching lens, even manufacturer at this point. So it, going in, I spent maybe 30 minutes and just monitoring like Johnny was with all three um, up at the same time and just kind of going like, oh, this one feels a little green or this one feels this way and like making slight little adjustments to each rig. I didn't, I didn't, I just, I don't know. I felt like I didn't take a crazy amount of time, maybe less than 30 minutes. And it wasn't like I was doing something scientific. It's more just to my eye, to my taste. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Great, great. And, and we're seeing a couple of uh, questions come up on the SDI port. And I do want to point out that we did uh, both for setting up FTP and for just having best SDI considerations. Um, these are up on red.com support. You can get a deeper dive on them there. But the one thing we just want to stress is that you're always we're recommending 12G SDI shielded cables. This is always what we're going to recommend for the best experience. And I understand because some of those monitors that we talked about right there that are red approved, they do ship with some of these non-shielded cables. So 
if, if we're worrying about not protecting or protecting our ports, I would recommend some of these shielded cables and it's gonna give you that best experience. Yeah, and there's a basic process as well. So the, the idea is that if you wanna be 100% safe, 100% of the time, you power the camera, the accessory, then plug in the SDI cable, and before powering down the camera accessory, you take the SDI cable off and then power down. That's the, the baseline, and I get it, not all of us are gonna do that all the time, but that's the one way to guarantee that you're not mm -hmm. gonna have that SDI issue. Mm -hmm. Also, if you can, potentially try swapping from DTAP to using something like a LIMO connection, which is a shielded power connection. I mean, one of the things there in, in, in regards to DTAP or PTAP cables, sometimes if you don't apply even pressure, the power pin might connect before the ground pin. So then that surge of power going through the, through the cable, through the body, has nowhere back out to go through that ground connector. Whereas a LIMO connection, all of those pins connect equally at the same time. Now, there are some cables and some accessories that either have a uh, longer ground pin, so it connects first, or the contacts on, on, on the DTAP uh, receptacle are longer to, to ensure that the ground always connects first. But if you are using DTAP, make sure you're applying even pressure down on it first to make sure that both are connecting at the same time. Mm -hmm. And I'm seeing one last question here from Justin come in. And Justin, uh, feel free to remind us, is this a red battery plate you're using or is this a third party plate? I believe he said core. A core plate. Well, I mean, I'm not an engineer here, but anytime you do have something physically connected to the battery and it is a powered, you, you are going to be starting to draw some, some power from that. I, I don't want to misspeak on core or, or any of the batteries that are attached, but the best way to worry about your batteries not drawing is just physically detach them. Yeah, that's something I hear from people uh, occasionally, and it's like, it's tough because I get the convenience of leaving the battery on, but in reality, the best practice is to pull your battery off at the end of well, the day. Well, the thing is, though, that also the camera's got to know how to wake. So because the switch on the Komodo is a software switch, although it's a physical switch, it's actually turning on through software. So that's got to have power to know when to turn on. So the camera's always trying to draw a little bit of power. So when you flip the switch, it does turn on. So they will slowly dr drain over time, essentially. And that's great for Clay and his gimbals, or if we are using that Dana dolly and the camera's way up on a big techno crane, right? As soon as we feed power to it and that switch is on, it's gonna go ahead and auto boot. So there's a reason behind that. Um, let's pull up this question here. Um, so all the files transferring uh, only LAN. So, so no, so depending on how you set your network up, it can be done only on the local area network. But if you go back to one of our previous sessions, James, I can't quite remember what your session was called on that. Uh, connecting Komodo. Connecting Komodo with port forwarding, you essentially open up that port to anyone who has the credentials. They can sign in and be pulling files, connecting. If they've got the app, they can type in that same address and connect and pull focus through that as well. Obviously, latency becomes a thing then, so focus pulling on the other side of the world may not be <laughs> ideal. But in, but in the case of that ProMotion rig that I showed earlier, yeah. where they've got this set up, you could have someone set the lens up and then you can then just adjust that focus to make sure it's sharp. We've got a link down in the description if you want to check their rig out, by the way, as well. And, and this is also with that red control app, you could set up a couple of different focus points, right? And then toggle between those points. And it's something where you can even set the time that you want to go from position one to position two. So yeah, there might be a latency, but getting on that call a little bit early, establishing, okay, I, I like to rock forward and then I like to rock back, kind of establish where your spots are. You could do that, but also remember Komodo now has, you know, phase detection autofocus in here. And really, I'm not sure if any of you guys have that turned on, but it's quite exceptional when you can see someone that likes to move around in their frame and, and see the camera follow focus with them the whole time. Just seen a question from uh, from Glebe here come in. We've actually got a fantastic session on this, and Clay's made a great video about this, going through the entire arsenal of the bodies and sensors, where we go through what the difference between Monstro, Helium, Gemini, Komodo, Ranger, and DSMC2 is, and how and when you would use them with some real life examples, and is showing some clips as well. So if you want to learn a bit more about that, definitely go check out either Clay's Red Tech or our Solitary series on the bodies and sensors. Yeah, we call that one the red arsenal, and it's it is like it now resolution can make a difference between some of them, but it's a lot bigger than that. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's potentially a good place to wrap it up, guys. What do you think? Yeah. yeah. 
some great questions here, and we love the interaction, right? I, I will say autofocus, right? All of these things still say beta on them, right? We are continuing to get better with every single uh, firmware update. Um, Komodo does have some limitations with reprogramming and things like that. So that speaker is there for, for your tally for the confirmation of record. Um, I, I would not plan on being able to Bluetooth into your camera and use that speaker to play your music from your phone. There's other great devices to do that. But uh, yes, it's primarily for confirming that role. Did we hear the beep? Yes, my, my gimbal operator can keep running down the road. Just one more question. I'll just pick one more question and then we'll kind of sign off here at that 50 minute mark uh, from Digi here. Um, so the Komodo can do autofocus because it's got phase detect autofocus points built into the sensor. That's a fundamental hardware decision on Komodo. Whereas Gemini and the DSMC2 and Ranger lineup, they haven't got those PDAF points. So that's not physically possible with those systems. So definitely go check out the Solitary series and Red Text to find out the differences and where you might want to choose each camera. But I want to thank everybody who's tuned in today. Um, we really appreciate all the support so far. We're going to be coming back with more and more Solitary Series. So drop us an email on solitaryseries at red.com if you want to send us any suggestions for in the future. This is a little teaser for one that's in the works. We're looking at ISO and black shading. That's one of the things we've had hotly requested. So we're currently working on that one. Uh, but I want to thank everyone. Stay safe. And we'll see you guys very, very soon. Yeah, see everybody. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Johnny.